afternoon again, everybody. We're going to continue on. Good afternoon again, everybody. We're going to continue on with the Twelve Steps of Life Study tonight. We're going to talk about a little bit more about my brother, John. Uh, if you've read the bio, you know John's a, a very smart guy. He has a master's in operational <laughs> management. Organi okay. Okay. Continue. Okay. As I was saying, Don has a master's in organizational management. If you've read the bio, you know Don's a very intelligent guy. Uh, he's going to talk about building the team for a successful SOC. And I know firsthand uh, about Don's ability to do so as I worked in a SOC with Don. And I felt smarter every day just sitting next to Don. So Don's going to do his talk now. Please welcome Don Warnicky, everybody. Thank you, everybody. And Doug did literally sit next to me during that time. So. As you said, my name's Don Warnicky, and I'm going to talk about building the team for a successful SOC. Um, this presentation was, is an adaption of one that I gave at the SAN SOC Summit, and so that's why it's specifically talking about a SOC. But I wanted to keep it kind of that focus because it makes less generalization. Um, and before we get into the material, though, I, got, I, I want to learn a little bit about you, you folks. So how many of you within your organization, you have a SOC? Okay. How many of you work in the SOC? Okay. Good. Good. Um, how many of you are involved in, whether it's in the SOC or, or anyplace else, involved in hiring decisions, whether that's as a hiring manager or just maybe you're invited to be part of an interview panel. Okay. Last question is, how many of you think that, in particular with a SOC, but any other security services that are offered, that the people that are, that are providing those services will have an impact on how successful they'll be? Great. I, I believe that as well, of course. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, my name is Don Warnicky. I have been doing this for 20 years. I did sit next to Doug. Um, I have an associate of business in microcomputer business systems on the academic <coughs> side. I have a master's in organizational management. Um, some of the certifications that I, that I have are the CIS, the incident handling, and the system and network uh, auditing from SANS. Uh, the Palo Alto certification, uh, as well as a few others that aren't on the slide. You know, I've been Cisco Checkpoint, ISS certified. Um, most of my experience has been within the DOD or the utility industries. Um, and just for anybody else that's interested in management and behavior and things like that, I believe in strength-based development. So, you know, you may see some of that uh, that slant come out of come out of my thoughts. So the agenda, what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about what is a SOC, briefly. We're going to talk about the right person for leading a SOC, in particular when it's first being stood up. We're going to talk about the right people to be in the SOC. And lastly, we'll talk a little bit about dealing with people that are a problem. Yes, Kate? <laughs> so what is a SOC? We're not going to, within this forum, talk about you know, the functions of a SOC or how it's done. The most important thing, point that I want to get across is that a SOC is a business tool. It's something to accomplish your organizational goals in the same way that accounts payable and <coughs> ground transportation is. That, that um, excuse me, <laughs> that one size doesn't fit all. Um, that Whenever you, as an example, you should be reading the best practices that are out there, whether you read ones from Gartner or Forrester or just read white papers, but those best practices need to be nuanced for your environment because your organizational needs should determine your mission with the mission of the SOC. It should also determine what type of people are in the SOC and the capability of those people. So when I think about the right person to be leading, leading a SOC, again, in particular in the beginning, 
or when you're making major changes to it, but this would be true of any security services or even, even IT. Um, I've done a lot with, with Knox as well. The first thing that's on my list, which may not be, a lot of people may not think of, is the business acumen. They need to understand what the purpose of the business is, what those priorities should be. They need to be able to determine to make sure that when you're prioritizing work within your SOC or within other areas, that, that it's, it's focused on um, what the business is trying to accomplish and that you're focused on making sure that you're providing the services that are needed for that. When uh, I, I no longer work within a SOC, um, I, was, I was moved to another area, but I was on the interview panel of the, looking for the, the guy to replace me. And this was very important to me. It was absolutely one of the things that I was, I was looking for. And let me know if I get a little too close. I know I move around a lot. Um, was to make sure that, that he was interested in that business acumen. And while he didn't come, the person that we did ended up selecting, he didn't come from the utility industry. But based on our conversations, it was clear that, that he had an understanding of the industry that, and the, the company that he worked for and that he understood the importance of, of understanding that business and, and applying that information to what, what you're doing, be it the way that you're giving presentations or being the priorities. And um, so, so that was actually absolutely something that I was looking for and that you should be looking for as well if you're involved in developing those people or something that I didn't say for anybody that's not involved in any of those areas you know, looking at your own self and, and what characteristics you have and what things that you pursue. Another thing that the leader within the SOC needs to do is have an emphasis on projects and pro or, excuse me, process and people. Making sure that you're being able to do consistent processes so that it works the same way every time. So that you're, you're um, able to, to have a product that that isn't missing things, that isn't the, done wildly different every time. And also making sure that, that you, they have a focus on people, trying to give people what they need, trying to encourage people, trying to make sure that they understand that your people will have a huge impact on what you get done. One of the reasons that this is particular to, particularly true within a SOC is there's a lot of jobs that can be absolutely process driven, that you do things exactly the same way every single time you check out that vehicle exactly the same way every time. And unfortunately, the things that, that happen within a SOC don't roll that way. <coughs> they don't quite work that way. And, and so making sure that you are able to attract those talented people are important, and that leader has, a, has a, a lot to say about that. The next thing is having a, a knowledge of the tools of the trade. Truth be told, the only reason this is on the slide is in case you're ever seeing my slides and I'm not there talking. I didn't want to give the impression that this isn't important. This leader should be able to rely a lot on the, on the people within the team. In, in my last SOC, we had 32 processes and tools that we had SMEs assigned to. There's no way that I could be an expert on every single one of those. But it was very important that I understood the, the capabilities of all of those tools. And then if I had to jump in there, that I could. Uh, but uh, understanding that, that, that having that familiarity and understanding how those tools need to be used is, is definitely important, though. Another thing is they need to allow to have a little fun. If your sock is a pressure cooker all of the time when you're just doing normal business, when, when bad stuff happens, it's going to crack. You know, the people are going to crack. And, and the processes aren't going to work. So there needs to be an opportunity to have a little fun, you know, the, the old let your hair down. One of the nice things about a lot of socks is that they're a bit cordoned off from the rest of the, the people, the, you know, the community, instead of just being in a cubicle farm. I think it's because they don't want people like me to get out. But, but I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. But it allows you to maybe be a little louder than, than you might otherwise be. You know, have, have a little jokes that may not be appropriate in the middle of a cubicle farm. I don't mean having inappropriate jokes. I mean, as an example, a loud joke. Uh, but, but allowing that to have a little bit of fun. And it, it also helps the team kind of geo. 
I misuse that word, but, but yeah, coalesce. <clears throat> and this is this last one is a bit of is a bit stylistic, but from my perspective, they have to be empowering, but with a light hand on on the tiller. You know, you, they have to allow people to take, as an example, in my case, my SMEs, to be able to have ownership of, of what they're doing. And talented people don't want to just do what you told them to do. They want to, to have an impact and they want to have some control and, and giving them that. At the same time, there needs to be boundaries. You know, I, I once had a, somebody walk up to me and say, a very talented person, say, you know, I'm really glad that, that we have those, uh, that, that we have those lines. Because one, it allows us to know when we're going to step out of line. And so we don't have to worry about getting into too much trouble because, you know, you let us know if we go a little too far, we can push those barriers. But I really think the other thing is that they know that the wild bill in the cubicle next to them is going to also have those boundaries to make sure that they're going to be staying within a kind of consistent strategy so everybody's moving in the same direction. So we've talked about the right leader. So who's the right staff? Who's the right people to be working within your SOC? The first thing, probably the most important thing, is they need to be enthusiastic. My next slide is going to talk about enthusiasm, so I'll leave. That's all I'll say about that for now. The next two things is, one, they need to be trustworthy. People working in the SOC are going to have a lot of access, and so they need to be able to be trusted with that access. And not only trusted to do the right thing that they're supposed to be doing, but also to make good, to have good judgment and make good decisions when they're trying to do the right thing to make sure they don't screw something up. <clears throat> um, sorry, I lost my thought. So this is very important because the other thing that people within a SOC can oftentimes do, as an example, with respect to an investigation, is they have a lot of discretion on what gets pursued and what doesn't because they have to make decisions on, on prioritizing that work as well as deciding whether this is interesting enough to pursue that it might be a security incident. And just that decision alone, just having that discretion, you need to have people that are trusted, not only by, by the leader of the SOC, but by other people within the company. It's very important. I, I, many years ago, was working with a guy, and at that time we, we had PC Anywhere. And I don't know how many of you know what PC Anywhere is. Yeah. But you know, you have the screen in the back, and you leave the monitor turned off, and essentially when somebody remotes in, they remote into that machine. If you turn on the monitor, you're going to see exactly what they're doing. And that's how we did remote it in back then. And there was an individual that had not only went over and was watching and saw one of our, he was a peer of mine, watched one of our, our, our other Marines, um, who was writing a, an email to his girlfriend, but he also went ahead and added a few words and things like that. And so, you know, I, and back there in the mid-90s, you know, an active duty Marine kind of privacy was treated a little differently back then, but, um, but I, I invited him out to the hall, and we, we had a discussion. By the way, the only reason I knew about this is because he was also bragging about it the next day. And, and we had a discussion about, about the, whether or not that was appropriate. And, and his defense was, well, well, we say that, we're gonna, that you might be monitored, and that the guy shouldn't be writing a, you know, this is a government machine. He shouldn't be writing an email to his girlfriend anyways. But those weren't really my fundamental problem in the discussion with him. He truly didn't understand that why I was talking to him about it. He, he really couldn't grasp that there was any issue with the behavior whatsoever. It, and those kind of things are, are a bit of a sign. And, and maybe some people would agree with him. But, but the lack of comprehension, a few years later after I'd left, the, I'd left the organization, I believe he had left the organization as well, I learned that they were running software, unlicensed software on production servers because they needed some functionality. And I don't mean software that didn't require a license, it just wasn't. Um, and, and there were several other little kind of behaviors that led that she could have expected that kind of thing from, from him. 
And so you've got to have an eye out for that, that, that kind of behavior. Obviously, that's, that's difficult to assess from an external candidate, but it's easy to assess from internal candidates. Oh, wrong button. Another thing is the capacity to learn. You need people that have a capacity to learn. I've worked with a couple of guys that, that had you know, a decade or two of experience. Um, because they were in sales or more of a help desk role, um, they, they weren't real senior people within, within cybersecurity. One of them that I, that, that I personally hired, um, he, if you wanted him to, to build a stairs or maybe put an addition on your house, he was the guy. He could do it great. And if you showed him something, he took great, robust notes, and he could do exactly that. And he was incredibly tr uh, trustworthy or could be relied on to be at work on time every day. But if what you needed him to do left those notes that he had written down, he had great difficulty <coughs> doing it. it in, to the degree that you had to go back three or four times kind of re-explaining because you were to something else that was a little bit new. And he really didn't have the capacity to learn. Not within, not within security anyway, cybersecurity. Um, and, and so recognizing that is important. And that was a case where I missed it. There was another person that, one of the things I remember, he joined my team as part of a reorganization. And um, I was having a conversation with him about possibly joining the team. Me and, me and a director was sitting next to me. And one of the things that he said to me, you know, we asked, well, do you have any questions for us? And the first question was, yeah, why are you talking to me? I mean, I'm really interested, but, but I, I don't really understand why you're even talking to me. You know, I was Cisco certified many years ago, but, but, but what attracted you to me? Um, and the role that we were looking to fill was actually the, the guy to like, take the first whack at tickets as they came in. And then if he didn't understand the ticket, then he would go talk to somebody a little more senior and could turn the ticket over to them. But this individual, rather than turning the ticket over, they, they're like, okay, show me exactly how to do this. And if it was so complicated that it wasn't something that could be dealt with then, maybe the engineer even had to do some research. He absolutely was coming back to find out how to do it. And, and that, kind of, that kind of desire to learn and, and willingness to learn and ability to learn, because he continued to grow and grow, um, is, is the type of thing that you want to look for, and, and you really need that in your shop. And I don't mean to suggest that the individual is going to be, you know, writing code on the fly anytime soon, but those are exactly the kind of people that you want. Business versus hobbyists. When I say business, I'm generally talking about somebody that, you know, they're interested in, in business capability, they're, you know, like to do PowerPoints, you're very comfortable going and talking to the CIO. And when I think of hobbyists, I think of somebody who, you know, you've got to kick them out of the office and they are like, fine, I'll go home and do it there. And, you know, those, those kind of people. Um, and, and I've worked for an individual that he only wanted to hire hobbyists. That's all he was interested in because he felt that they could learn so much more, so much faster, that all of your resources should, should go to hobbyists. My main point is not that one's better than the other, it's that you need both. You really do. And if, if you're, you know, the, the kind of stymied organization that, that everything and everybody wears a suit, you, you, you may need to try to get some hobbyists in there. Or if you're, you know, everybody has blue hair, you know, there, there might be some value in getting, getting somebody a little more business oriented in, uh, a little more interested in that kind of thing. You need people to, that are a little daring. Again, in particular in a SOC, minutes can matter. There are times, not many, but times that seconds can matter within your SOC. And so you need people that are, that are willing to act in those times, that, that aren't concerned about taking an action if, if they don't get the approval from, from a manager or, or that kind of thing. You need people that are a little daring. Now, we're, you know, Let's not forget this up here, right? They need to be doing testing. They need to be doing all the things that need to be done, you know, making good decisions, but a little daring. And I had a situation of my own 
You know, I got a call from from my midnight shift that that you know the migrations are are the migration team's in trouble because during controls testing it turned out that that a server that shouldn't be able to talk to hardly anything could talk to a whole lot of stuff it shouldn't be able to. And so I came in, and it turned out what had happened. There was a, a government-approved rule that we were trying to get rid of. And so that was getting broken apart. And as part of that, you know, six weeks, eight weeks into the process, a couple of rules had been combined that shouldn't have been. You know, a bunch of stuff to a few servers, and a few servers to a bunch of stuff got to combined, so a bunch of stuff to a bunch of stuff was now the rule. And that was in there. Um, and what ended up happening is I ended up having the rule removed. Just decided to remove the rule. I was running the sock at the time. Um, and I, I literally thought I was going to lose my job. I didn't think it was a question of when or if. It was absolutely a question of when. Now, uh, luckily, um, it turned out that you know the, the good works that I had done previously uh, gave me a little bit of, I don't know, a get out of jail free card. Um, because ultimately the problem was that if I was, or what I didn't say was, if I did have to walk out the door, I felt that that one action did more security, for security, than, you know, anything that we'd done in the last, in the last couple of years. Uh, because it was going to, to be able to properly get that rule out was going to take weeks of it being in there. And, and that was going to be a problem. Um, now, obviously, if I was doing the best job, the rule would have never got in there, right? I would have, be it better training, be it better oversight, it wouldn't have been there, but it was. But another example of where a little daring that, that in hindsight may not sound it, sound like it so much, but it, but it really was at the time. And that was, we were having a penetration test done. Our SOC didn't know that it was a penetration being done, penetration test being done. But there was a penetration test being done. And the, the tester was uploading files onto one of our web servers because of a vulnerability in the server. Um, and it was suggested by, by one of the members of the team that we go ahead and, and essentially put in a block. And we, we used our brain as much as we could, and we didn't believe that there was going to be a customer impact. But you know, in, in, in the 20 minutes that you're figuring it out, you haven't done testing. You don't know, really. Um, and we did end up putting in that block. And admittedly, when we found out, by the time we actually got it implemented, we had learned, because management was like, yeah, don't call the FBI. This is actually a pen test. Still respond as if you don't know, because, because we want to continue to see how the response is. But, but yes, this is actually a test. So we could easily say, well, you know, we'll just pretend we would have done it. But we went ahead and did it. The more of a little daring is at the end of it, when we would go ahead and remove all anything that we might have done, the decision was made, you know, the, the person that put it in said, you know, why don't we, why don't we leave this here? Again, we, we took, this has now been two hours, so in two hours we haven't had a customer impact, but, but there's, there's a lot of variables out there. And, and we decided to, to indeed leave it in there. A couple of months later, through our, our threat intelligence and monitoring what's happening with other people, reading reports from DHS, it turned out that there was a number of utilities that were actually compromised using that same vulnerability that had been used against us. And so we went back to check, you know, just to, to make sure that we hadn't detected anything, but let's make sure that we, we didn't get compromised in the process too. And it turned out that that block that we had put in two months before was actually blocking the active attacks. And so those kind of wins you get from people thinking outside the box and, and being willing to take a little bit of risk. Now back to enthusiastic, right? So we talked a little bit about being daring. <coughs> One of the things that's important and, and in fact critical to understand, at least the managers out there, but really everybody out there in your interaction with your peers, is you can destroy be a little daring very easily within your organizations. If people think from the slightest mistake, even if they, you know, they did the testing, but there's a mistake in the process, that they're just going to lose their job over it, they're not going to be daring. The people that are daring are going to go find a job that they're not going to lose, that they don't have to feel stress every other day that they're going to lose their job. 
And so your organization can have a huge impact on that. And the reason I say individuals even that aren't, that, that may not feel like they have any say in that, can, can have an impact on the way they talk to each other about it. Right? The way that they talk to each other about the types of things that they may want to, may want to implement or steps that they may want to take. So why is enthusiasm important? Enthusiasm is really important because of the way people spend their discretionary in or, do that a lot. Discretionary energy. Um, and by the way, I, I believe that I stole, I don't know if he was the originator, I stole this term from the CIO of DT Energy. Uh, he used that term and I'm like, that's exactly what I'm what I'm talking about. Um, but the how they spend their discretionary energy. You know, I walk into my sock and there isn't, I, I don't have any issue with somebody spending a little bit of time on, you know, kind of some downtime, researching something that isn't specifically work related. But I walk in and I look to the left and the, the person's, you know, they're taking a break, they're researching MMA, you know, mixed martial arts, you know, looking up some weapons and who won the fight last night and that kind of stuff. And I look to my right and, and back then we didn't have any, any eye stuff, you know, we didn't have any iPhones. And he's research, he's taking some downtime researching the latest hack on the iPhone. And when you think about which one of these individuals three years from now that's going to add more value, it's almost, not always, it's almost always going to be the person that, that just loves this stuff, that's enthusiastic about it. Now, that's not, that doesn't mean that you should be looking for people that the only thing they care about is what we do. You know, back to that idea of everybody's got to be a hobbyist. Probably the number two most talented person that's ever worked for me actually considered um, going professionally into MMA. The distinction was that he was just as passionate about IT and cybersecurity as he was about MMA. And so it isn't, I, I'm sure, I don't know how many people I've known that have an interest in MMA. Is that, is that common? You guys know a lot of people do you have MMA and IT? Anyway, so that, that dis how they spend their discretionary, income, discretionary energy comes out of that enthusiasm. Now, I work in the utility in industry today, which means that we are not the highest paid guns out there. Um, but what we do do, what we do have, what I can offer to my people, is I can ensure that they're doing very valuable work. And talented people want to do valuable work. If any of you are in that position that you're wonderfully paid, but you despise going to work every day, you know that there's limits to what the pay can do. And in fact, there's a study that says that job satisfaction and job dissatisfaction aren't on the same scale. They're actually different scales. And different things affect them. Money can affect job dissatisfaction. It can reduce dissatisfaction, but it can't increase job satisfaction. Um, so making sure that people are doing valuable work and, and encouraging and, and making sure people understand understand that or, or have that feeling. As an example, one of the things that I've done in my one-on-ones with, with my employees is to, to actually sit down and talk about how the work that they do, the specific work that they do, has a direct line of sight to the company's goals and the, and the company's accomplishments. But in addition to the company's accomplishments, the community's accomplishments, either, either one, I shouldn't say in addition, whichever ones they come up with, their interest with, whatever they bring to the table, I'm asking for either one. And what I also do is for each one of them is I'll create a list of my own. So not only do they, because you don't want to go to your boss and say, yeah, nothing, I don't do anything valuable. There's, there's no one. So they'll come up with something on their own. But when they sit down to talk about the wonderful things that they came up with that they might not have realized before they went through that exercise, then I have a, a list of two or three things that I can tell them as well, in, uh, hopefully in addition to the ones that they came up with. Another way that that can be impacted can be very simple stuff, like a lot of times, being in a SOC, we had a daily meeting. A lot of times I would end that daily meeting with, and let's go do good things. Or, or something like that. Just just little things to be able to, to reiterate that we're trying to do good, or not that we're trying to, that we are doing good work and we should be focused on doing good work. 
and that what we do is valuable. Competition is another thing that, that is helpful for both building enthusiasm, but enthusiastic people are likely to, to, to partic excuse me, participate in as well. Um, I don't subscribe to Jack Welsh's, hey, you just take everybody, you break them into three groups, you put your resources at the top group, and you get rid of the bottom group. And then when they get replaced, you're going to have some good people in there, and, that and then you, you know, next year you get rid of the bottom group again, and eventually everybody's stellar. Because my experience has been, and that worked very, he was very successful doing it, with the company he did it, when he did it, at that time. Um, but my experience has been that, that creates this environment where people want to hoard knowledge. They want to hoard success. They don't want to share it because they don't want to risk falling below the line. So, but there are many ways that you can do competition, whether it's as simple things as, as, you know, let it, letting folks kind of talk about the, the line of credentials behind their name. Um, excuse me. Another way that, that, that we did it at one of my, or my last SOC, was that uh, there were, last year there was a conference, a, a regional conference in this area. And at the conference there was a capture the flag, just like there is today. And at that capture the flag, we told our employees that if one of our employees took first place within that capture the flag, then we would give them a Nest, a Nest programmable uh, thermostat. And if they got first, second, and third place, that uh, we would have a, information security would have a, a party, basically. So at that event, uh, there was about 20 people there or so. There are different rooms. I apologize. I don't, I don't know the exact number now. Uh, Cybersecurity folks took first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and ninth place at that event. Now, part of the reason that they were able to do that was certainly the competition. But one of the other things was that one of the things that we do with, I can't say all, but most of our cybersecurity staff, is that they get a lab firewall that they take home and install. That allows them to get some experience with the interface, to use, um, use some of the features that we don't use at work in production, and, and play around with that. And so these folks, they went ahead and they got they connected VPNs between their home networks and authorized each other's to hack, or excuse me, to, to do testing on their test networks. And so they were busy playing around with each other's networks and built up that skill leading up to the up to their to the event. Another important thing about enthusiastic people that helps them be enthusiastic as well, it's reinforcing, is that they take their job seriously. They're, they ensure that they do a good job. They ensure that it's thorough, that the testing works. Because the, the last thing they want to happen is to, to have their skill set or the thing that they're interested in be a failure. And so they put in that effort to make sure that it works right. But it's important that they don't take it too seriously. Because if the person that can't stand for anybody to have an opinion different than theirs is put in the midst of that group, it's going to have, it's going to have a negative impact on them. On, on that cohesion. And so you got to be very careful of that as well. Teamwork or talent. This is oftentimes a, a, an interesting debate about what's more important. It's probably easy to tell at this point that I'll take teamwork over talent. I once interviewed a guy and one of the questions that I tend to ask in an interview is I have, I, I have or I'm building or what have you a team of security professionals, what is it that you bring to the table that I should know about that you're going to add to this team? And then another question that I'll tend to ask is, so what is it that's a gap of yours? What is it that's something that if I have a gap on my team and I hire you, I'm going to continue to have that gap on my team because you don't do it. And I had a guy kind of thought for a second, looked at me and said nothing. If you need something done, I probably know how to do it. And if I don't know how to do it, I can figure it out. And I didn't hire him. And it's not because I doubted him. Well, I guess I did doubt that anybody has that level of, of skill. Um, although maybe the I can figure it out part was true. Um, it, it, but it had nothing to do with whether he truly was, you know, walking on water 
compared to anybody else. It was that he struck me as the type of person with that response and a few others, as the type of person that would make others feel stupid, rather making others achieve more. The reason that I think teamwork is so important is because KSA spread. Knowledge, skills, and abilities, maybe not so much abilities, knowledge and skills, they spread throughout a team. And if you have good teamwork, if you have people working together, if you have people showing each other how to do stuff, if you have people interacting at that level, they're all going to get better. The other thing is that they can be a catalyst. I once had a guy working for me that, I swear to you, every hour that he worked, I lost money. I did. It was a contract. His salary was about equivalent to his bill rate. So after we paid for benefits and vacation and stuff like that, every hour that, he, that, that we paid him, we billed less than it cost us. But I was able to justify keeping him on the team, and I had to justify it a couple of times. And the reason was is because he made everybody else so much better. Because of the skills that he could impart on some of our other security monitoring staff of the application he was able to write that would allow a very manual process that we were going through to actually be automated. You know, the kind of DevOps stuff that, that we talk about at this conference. And for those reasons, I absolutely wanted to keep him on the team, even if him personally cost me more money than, than what he was billing. So what about dealing with difficult people? Has anybody worked with a difficult person before? Okay, just, just checking. I don't want anybody running out of the room or something. Is anybody in here a difficult person? Okay. Got a bunch of honest people. I love it. Um, I was going to say, even if nobody raised their hand, that in talking about this, you can sometimes think about, you know, if you are that difficult person, on, on how this applies to you, because it very much can. The first thing I have to say is that you've got to figure out why they're difficult. Why, you know, if you look around and half of your team is crap, you have a process problem, not a person problem. And you need to screw fixing the person problem. I mean, you, you got to do that too. Of course, here I'm not talking about most of you who raise your hand. I'm talking about a real problem. Um, and I'm, some of you may be a real problem too. We'll take that away from you. Um, but ultimately, there's got to be this decision. And if it's a process problem, you need to treat that like an incident, right? You need to start doing an RCA and figure out why this is happening to your organization. And if, it if it's not your problem, if it's an HR problem, you need to involve them in finding a solution. Because, because you can't keep this up, right? I don't know about any of you. Actually, I do. I don't know about every one of you. I, I looked at every one of your companies as a lot, by the way. And I know that you don't have endless resources, that you could use more people than you have, because we're all in that boat. And so you can't, you, you've got to address those kind of things. The next thing is, if it is a person problem, is, the, is it the role or is it the attitude? Is the person miscast in the role either because that role doesn't use their talents or because maybe there's a, 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 a uh, I don't know, a problem between that, that individual's style and their manager's style. Because there may be a very, a very, that person may be able to be put into a role that they can use all of their talents and they can be very, very um, successful. Because everybody out there has talents. Everybody out there, unless they just have an incredibly horrible attitude, and I've met very few people that are actually in that boat, um, there is the right role for people. And what, what leaders need to do is try to facilitate their success. And as a peer, you may be able to do a little bit of this, but primarily it's, it's, it's a leader function. And for facilitating their success means giving them proper feedback, both positive and negative feedback. And, and that'll help them get to the right place that they can be successful even if it's not with your organization. You can, you can help them do that. Oh, I missed one, positive and negative. And, but positive and negative feedback is very important 
It's important as a, to, with your peers as much as you can give it. Some people, of course, don't want the guy in the cube next to them saying, by the way, here's a way you might be able to do that better. Most of our talented people are good with that. Um, some aren't. But in addition to that, um, one area that I agree with Jack Walsh on is that you're doing a disservice to, to, to your people if you're not giving them accurate feedback. Because you're preventing them from finding the job that they can be successful in and can apply their talents in a way that adds, adds more value. So in summary, um, building a SOC involves the uh, understanding the organizational needs, getting the right leader in place to, to be able to do that, to be able to, to implement that, as well as getting enthusiastic employees and empowering them to do the right thing. Now, what's really interesting is I've got almost 15 minutes left for questions, which is great, but I cut a bunch of stuff out of this presentation because when I gave it at SANS, I somehow had it under time. I practiced it twice since then. I was over every time, so I cut it out. <laughs> so, do you have any questions? If not, I'll force you to listen to a couple more stories. <laughs> Can you go back to the summary slide? Yes, ma'am. Any questions beyond that? Yes, sir. So how much of what you've been talking about is based on the organization that you find yourself managing within? So... Because you're in a utility, right? I have been for the last five years. Um, so that's, that's little, uh, yep. So the fifteen year the fifteen years before that, I was within either active duty or contractor within the Department of Defense. So that's also a fairly stringent organization. Um, I don't believe hardly anything of what I said is based on the industry itself, um, and I I believe that one because again my academics is organizational management, so I've done a lot of research and reading in these areas. Um, not only did I do I, did I, have I run a couple of NOx, actually built NOx, built and run SOx um, at different organizations, actually in different countries. Um, I've also done a little bit of work with uh, another energy uh, company in proposals, because I used to do proposals for my the company that I, that I was with. In addition to running my SOC, when I had proposals with other for other jobs, I was kind of the cybersecurity guy. Technically, we're a logistics part of our company. Our contract was focused on logistics, um, and so I was involved in a lot of those contracts. So that's kind of the long answer, and I don't know how much comfort it gives you. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, um, my company doesn't have any. SOC uh, team yet, so we program where you use the desk because they are first level support for the application desktop, server network, web app. So, how much, uh, to what degree would you expect from that SOC perspective for the help desk team? So, definitely the, the help desk mission is, is different. And, and so it, a lot of what we talked about doesn't apply. Um, how, who does you, the security services? Do you have any IDSs being monitored? Is that done by the server team, I assume? No, network team. Network team? Okay. Yeah. Oh, so they're all network based no. rather than host based? Uh, different. I mean, with the like, service team, they do have some kind of an understanding tool. Network team, they are working on the IDS. So security team. So most of your help desks are going to be uh, the only non knock sock hiring that I've done was actually for a lead for, for the help desk at, at a at a contract where I was the sock I, I ran sock um, and, and help desks are a little different. 
characteristics that you're looking for because they're much more process oriented. Because if it isn't in the process, you typically hand it off to another team. Um, so some of the stuff that I talked about doesn't isn't isn't the same. As well as most people, and SAIC was a little bit different, they developed a, a process that they could have a help desk where you could be the help desk expert, um, which is, was very interesting the way we did it. But um, The help desk is oftentimes also looked at as like the development ground for the other teams too. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly how much of this would it apply to that team? Um, I, I definitely think a lot of it will. Because talented people are talented people. You know, you think about doing valuable work. There's absolutely a way to make sure that your help desk understands the the line between what they're doing and what's important to the company, and can feel like the work that they're doing is important. Um, there's also a lot of ways to to allow help desk people to be empowered even though most stuff is process oriented. You know, there are cases where maybe there's some, some budgeting that's being done by the help desk manager. Well, some of the lower level budget items may be able to be done by the help, by a member of the help desk. Um, so there, there's ways like that to empower it. Uh, you can also have a member or a few members of the help desk be more like QA so that in addition to working their own tickets, and this is more work obviously for them, but in addition to doing their own tickets, they can do the quality assessment work that the lead oftentimes does related to other tickets, other people's tickets. Does that answer your question enough? Yeah, so basically as you mentioned, the help desk guy are very process oriented. So if we uh, have some detailed SOP for them, uh -huh. So it will, they can accomplish the, 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 the other thing that you can do, so the, the best help desk, there's a feedback loop. So the ticket, I, help desk can't fix the ticket, it goes to, goes to the, you know, the server team. Server team fix the ticket. Well, is there a way that that process can be fed back into the help desk so the next time the help desk can fix that ticket? And if you have that feedback loop, those are the kind of things you can say, okay, you know, help desk agent four, you're kind of going to be our liaison to the server team. And, and you're going to maintain that and make sure, you know, maybe have weekly meetings, uh, depending on how much time they can be spared for it, you know, maybe a weekly meeting to say what tickets have been sent to you and how can those processes be moved over this to the help desk. Something like the knowledge database? The, yes, the same thing for the other, other areas. Database is a lot less likely to be anything to help desk because they're generally not given the rights. Um, but but that can be looked at as well. Thanks. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Yeah, kind of, kind of a couple questions that are kind of related. One, uh, if there is a scenario where you bring out some building a sock as inheriting one. Okay. Uh, so it's already it's, it's kind of already in place and maybe you're the new maybe you're the new sock manager or person overseeing the sock. And then the other and then the other maybe more something else, Dealing more trenchant with the bigger companies, whatever is that the sock the sock that you have is actually a purchase service to another company entirely. So the personnel you may have a hand in 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 some of the vetting and all that, but they act like all of those and actually report to a third party vendor. Okay. So I wonder if you can speak to maybe those kind of deals situations. So with respect to in, inheriting the sock, um, if the sock already exists and they're not bringing, you know, as an example, sometimes the in, it, from an inherited sock, you don't mean like they're bringing three groups together and now it's a sock. You mean it's like well, you're having to that's happened to my company also is that they actually did that once. And, uh, yeah, in those cases, from my perspective, it really is building. It, it really is starting over. The big difference is, as an example, if you were if you were truly in the rare case where you're just you have nothing and you're going to hire a bunch of people, um, you would decide what services belong in the sock. In the case of bringing a sock together, a lot of times you basically get what other, whatever, you have to provide whatever services those teams were doing before they became part of the sock. Um, and so that, I think that's the big distinction there. Um, but I really do, when I, when I talk about building a sock, I really think that, that um, 
if you're if you're fundamentally changing what they do, um, that's such a shakeup that it really is building. You may not be able to make as big of a change to culture, and it might take a little longer to do so. But I think you still should be focused on the same type of leader. Um, and, and then about the like the, if, it, if there's like an extra layer of like you know interaction with bureaucracy where you're dealing with, with the third party or purchase service, the, the that. And how does that complicate things? So I have almost no experience with that other than being the third party at times. Um, so so take that for, take that for whatever it's like. Um, I would say to a large degree you're still going to be dealing with the same people problems. Just like I believe if you're talking about you know the, the AD management team, a lot of them have these same issues, they have the same right stuff. Uh, so I would say that you would still be looking for the same same stuff. The difference is, is they don't they don't necessarily work for you. And so much of what we talked about today is personnel items. So you can't change how valuable they think they are. Um, and I think most of it is out of your control. But there may be somebody other than me who's had more experience that that have found cheap ways that you can. <coughs> now I've definitely been in a situation where where I was a subcontractor running the SOF and somebody else ran the NOC. In fact, it was the prime contractor, which is a little weird because you know, largely they're kind of senior to you. And, and I've absolutely done what I could to change their culture to make them a little more, for one, keep people around a little longer. That, that's mm -hmm. always important. Yeah. But also to make sure that we can uh, just interact with them better. Yes, sir. I have a question for you, sir. Uh, you mentioned earlier about teamwork over talent. Yes. Let's say, uh, let's, let me put you in this scenario. Let's say uh, we're managing a SOG, and you'll notice that s certain analysts that are not playing, they're not sharing knowledge or keeping knowledge to themselves, and they're not playing uh, as a team players within the group. How would you deal with that? Okay. So one of the things that I should say, especially since there have been, although someone left the room, people in here that have worked for me, that, that I've, while I believe that, I absolutely believe that, I've had incredibly talented people that work for me. Um, and I've been able to retain them, which is, is one of the reasons I value that teamwork. Um, so, so how I would handle that is, number one, is I would, I would make sure that what you're doing with, as an example, uh, performance reviews and things like that, that, that it's listed as a problem. Because what a lot of people will do is they'll say, you know, I, this guy's too important, or, or gal, this, this person's too important. I can't lose them. So then they won't, they won't talk to them about what the, what the real problem is. And, and that's your first thing, is to make sure you don't do that. That, that, you, that you would rather and obviously you have to, if you're the person managing it, you have to live with the consequences, right? But you should rather lose that person and, and build up the entire team than keep them around and have everybody else be, remain inferior. And that's the position that I would take. And I would be clear with the person because maybe they're like that because, you know, as an example, Maybe they came from an organization that, that they're afraid that if anybody else knows anything, they're going to get fired. Or maybe another reason that a lot of people do that is they like the spotlight, right? Um, and, and so I'm not sure I can help them there, other than maybe give them a little more praise to make sure that, they, that they're getting some spotlight. But, but that's how I would deal with it. Any other questions? We, we have just a minute or two. Thank you very much for, for coming to the conference and for joining my, my talk.